Hello, everyone, and welcome to the STD Clinical Update webinar. Today's topic is Maternal and Congenital Syphilis Update for the California Prenatal Care Provider. Um, and today's speaker is Dr. Eric Tang. Dr. Eric Tang is part of the clinical faculty at the California Prevention Training Center and is a public health medical officer for the STD control branch at the California Department of Public Health. Dr. Tang received his medical degree at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and his master's of public health at the University of California, Berkeley. He currently sees patients at City Clinic, the municipal STD clinic in San Francisco. A few housekeeping things. Um, first, uh, our attendee speaker will be turned off during the webinar. Um, for video, the attendee video will also be turned off during the webinar. And so this is for attendees. The chat will be turned off during the webinar. However, you can submit questions on the Q&A and that will be turned on during the webinar. For Q&A, attendees can submit their questions to the hosts and presenter during the webinar up until the remaining two minutes of the Q&A section. Hosts will answer questions directly in the Q&A chat window throughout the webinar, and the presenter will answer questions live during the Q&A section. Please note, however, that not all questions may get to be answered during the Q&A. If you'd like to submit a question, click on the Q&A icon, which is um, illustrated here, from your control panel to open the Q&A chat window and type in your question. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the California Prevention Training Center or CAPTC. We are a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. Um, this is our logo and our abbreviation, which you might recognize. Um, and we collaborate with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and our one prevention training center out of eight, eight prevention training centers throughout the United States. Um, that is a part of the National Network of STD Clinical Prevention Training Centers. This is a regional map of the NNPTC regions. The California Prevention Training Center includes California as well as Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and Hawaii. This is our financial disclosure. And if you have any questions that come up, you're welcome to email our clinical program manager, Elizabeth Olson, her email address is here, elizabeth.olson at ucsf.edu. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and our presenter for today, Dr. Eric Tang. Uh, thanks, Dr. Plotzker. Um, so can you guys see my screen? Let me... Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Potter. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about maternal and congenital syphilis, um, provide an update, um, in particular recent um, re released recommendations from the California Department of Public Health SG Control Branch on um, expanding syphilis screening uh, recommendations. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, this talk is for prenatal care providers in California. I know that there's probably some non-clinicians as well as some public health staff that are on this call, but um, just wanna make note that that uh, this presentation is focused for uh, clinicians and particularly the prenatal care provider. So I have no disclosures. So uh, the learning objectives today include um, being able to describe the uh, current epidemiology of maternal and congenital syphilis, applying syphilis screening recommendations for pregnant patients, um, describing clinical manifestations, diagnostic approach, and management of syphilis among pre pregnant patients, and um, briefly identify key resources for questions about the management of syphilis among pregnant patients. So first, I'll start with epidemiology. Last year, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, announced that their 2018 surveillance data demonstrated that rates of all three reportable sexually transmitted diseases, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, continue to rise, marking the fifth year in a row for all three diseases, and together reached an all-time high. This includes uh, increasing rates of both syphilis and congenital syphilis, which I may refer to as CS during the presentation, and will be the focus of the talk today. In the 1990s, Syphilis rates were, oops, sorry. Um, 
In the 1990s, syphilis rates were coming down to historic low levels, so low that, in fact, in 1999, the CDC launched a national campaign to eliminate syphilis from the U.S. However, starting around 2000, both the U.S. and California started seeing an increase of syphilis cases among men. Most of these cases of syphilis were among men who have sex with men, or MSM, of whom half were also living with HIV. This epidemic has continued to increase in MSM and traditionally has been the population in which syphilis has been associated. However, there have been an increase in cases among females over the past few years, since about 2012, as well as increases among men who have sex with women. Nationally, there are, there's been reports of increasing numbers of heterosexuals with syphilis who report injection drug use, methamphetamine use, and heroin. Now there appears to be two epidemics of syphilis, one among MSM, and now another separate epidemic among heterosexual individuals, many of whom report illicit drug use. Over the last several years, California has experienced a steep increase in syphilis among females and infants. From 2012 to 2018, female syphilis cases increased 550%. And congenital syphilis cases increased by 900%. The number of infants born to a congenital syphilis increased for the sixth year in a row. In 2012, there were 33 congenital syphilis cases and only one syphilitic stillbirth. In 2018, there were 329 congenital syphilis cases and 19 syphilitic stillbirths. In 2018, California contributed about a quarter of the total congenital syphilis cases nationally. What makes this um, a lot, what makes these alarming numbers even more devastating is that congenital syphilis is completely preventable and can be avoided with testing and treatment during pregnancy. This slide compares a map of early syphilis incidents among females of childbearing age by county on the left with a map of congenital syphilis incidents by county on the right. Rates of both syphilis among females of childbearing age and congenital syphilis are, high, are highest among counties in the Central Valley, although we see high rates in other regions as well. This is a map of California showing the congenital syphilis cases um, by county in 2018. The darker the maroon, the higher the case count. The highest morbidity counties in terms of cases are in the central and southern, uh, the, the central and southern California. In 2018, 10 of the 58 counties had 10 or more cases of congenital syphilis. Many counties are seeing their congenital syphilis cases and rates increase, and some are experiencing their first congenital syphilis case in years, indicating that cases continue to spread. Most pregnant women with syphilis were between the ages of 20 and 34, and as this graph shows, the majority of cases of syphilis in pregnant women are Latina. However, the highest rate of syphilis among pregnant women were among black mothers, where the rate is four times the rate of white mothers, disturbing health disparities that need to be addressed. Here's a list of maternal risk factors reported by mothers of congenital syphilis infants in California. The most prevalent risk factor was limited or no prenatal care, defined either as no prenatal care or prenatal care that started in the third trimester. And this represents 57% of congenital syphilis cases, followed by methamphetamine use by over half of the mothers. Recent incarceration in the past year represented more than a quarter of cases, with homelessness as a factor in 18% of cases. IV drug use was also associated as a risk factor, but to a lesser degree than meth use specifically. What's important to note, however, is the context of these risk factors. Many of these women who are diagnosed with syphilis are living in a context of complex social determinants of health that may drive many of the risk factors reported. These social determinants of health include poverty, disparities in access to care, as well as stigma. These factors can result in daily living challenges that confound or interrupt prenatal care and communicable disease treatment, resulting in poor health outcomes for both the mother and baby. This slide intends to drive home the importance of social determinants of health on congenital syphilis. On the left, the map shows congenital syphilis rates by county, while the map on the right shows the percent of population in poverty by county. Many of the counties with the highest CS rates are the same counties with the ones that also have the highest percent of their population in poverty. Next onto screening. So I'm gonna introduce a case here. Um, we have Ava, who is a 27-year-old female, G4P3, at 11 weeks gestational age, who comes to you for her first prenatal care appointment after a recent positive urine pregnancy test at Planned Parenthood. She currently reports no symptoms, and physical exam is unremarkable. When you ask about previous STD testing, she reports having a negative syphilis test while inc incarcerated 10 months ago. You order a urine, gonorrhea, and chlamydia test, and what other STD screening? A, 
HIV and syphilis tests today, B, HIV today only, as she has had negative syphilis tests in the past year, C, HIV today and screen for syphilis later in pregnancy, or else she might be at risk for reinfection at the time of delivery, D, HIV today and screen for syphilis at delivery, and or E, no additional STD screening needed, as long as you screen for both HIV and syphilis before the third trimester. I'll give you a few moments to answer that question. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to end polling. Um, looks like um, Looks like most people, the vast majority of people um, chose A, which is the right answer. Um, so, sorry, I'm not, I think, sorry about that. Okay, um, so let me, yeah, so A is the right answer. Um, you're going to want to test for both HIV and syphilis at the first prenatal encounter, um, regardless of if they had any recent um, testing prior to pregnancy. So the CDC's um, 2015 STD treatment guidelines recommend syphilis screening in certain populations. So for uh, currently for non-pregnant women and men who have sex with women, um, the CDC recommends risk-based screening. For men who have sex with men, at least uh, so they should be screened at least annually and every three to six months um, if at increased risk. Um, this also includes um, those uh, who are on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, uh, the recommendation from the CDC's 2017 update um, to the uh, HIV PrEP guidelines indicate three to six months um, depending on risk, although there's more data suggesting screening people on HIV PrEP every three months um, can significantly reduce syphilis in this population. Corrections, um, there is a, a section that indicates um, that universal screening um, should be conducted on the basis of local area and institutional prevalence of early syphilis. Um, anyone who's diagnosed with chlamydia or gonorrhea should be uh, screened for syphilis. And um, anyone uh, who is HIV positive should be tested at first HIV evaluation and at least annually thereafter. And for pregnant women, which is a focus of this webinar, um, the CDC has a number of different recommendations. They include that all pregnant women be screened for syphilis at the first prenatal visit, ideally during the first trimester. However, um, when access to prenatal care is not optimal, patients should be screened with the RPR at the time pregnancy is confirmed and treated if that RPR is reactive. Certain places, including um, some Planned Parenthood clinics, have decided to screen all women with a positive urine pregnancy test for syphilis, HIV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, which I would consider a best practice. The CDC currently recommends screening again at early in the third trimester at 28 to 32 weeks gestation and again at delivery if the patient is either at high risk for infection or living in a community or as part of a population with a high prevalence of syphilis. High risk may be determined by either individual patient behavior or local syphilis morbidity. Finally, all women who have a stillbirth defined as fetal death after 20 weeks gestation should be screened for syphilis to help determine if this could be the cause of the death. Of note, the CDC states that a mother and neonate should not be discharged from the hospital unless the syphilis serologic status of the mother has been determined at least one time during pregnancy and preferably again at delivery if at high risk. For more than 20 years, California has required providers to screen all pregnant patients at first prenatal encounter, ideally during the first trimester. The California Health and Safety Code states that every licensed physician and surgeon engaged in prenatal care of a pregnant woman or attending the woman um, at the time of delivery shall obtain a blood specimen that shall be submitted for a standard lab test for syphilis. Just last week on December 8th, the CDC SD control brands released expanded syphilis screening recommendations for the prevention of congenital syphilis. These guidelines are for California medical providers. We also released a Dear Colleague letter for providers summarizing the new recommendations. Given the alarming increasing rates of 
general syphilis for the sixth consecutive year, we recognize the urgent need to expand syphilis screening to ensure detection, timely treatment, and subsequent general syphilis prevention. While many local health jurisdictions already have um, expanded syphilis screening guidelines, which may include third trimester screening and even um, delivery screening, um, many of the prenatal care providers in California are members of large healthcare organizations that serve patient populations that cross jurisdictional lines and provide care at multiple sites in different jurisdictions. Such providers benefit from statewide universal recommendations, allowing a routinization of practice across settings and providers. The guidelines include six overall recommendations for California medical providers, three focused on pregnant patients and three focused on people who could become pregnant. They are evidence-based recommendations for their potential to prevent congenital syphilis. Given the alarming rise of congenital syphilis due to the increasing prevalence of syphilis among people who are and could become pregnant in California, CDPH endorses additional syphilis screening during pregnancy in line with national recommendations that recommend additional testing um, during pregnancy in high prevalence areas. However, because the majority of California congenital syphilis cases in 2017 and 2018 were born to pregnant people with delayed or even no prenatal care, CDPH supports a more thorough multi-pronged approach to case detection and congenital syphilis prevention, which includes expanded syphilis screening for people who could become pregnant. This is especially important for people identified in settings that serve populations at increased risk for syphilis, as well as patients who might have disruption in prenatal care and communicable disease treatment due to contributing social factors such as substance use, incarceration, poverty, and homelessness. Improved prenatal care is also needed for persons at risk for syphilis, but is beyond the scope of these recommendations. Lastly, these guidelines are based on California state um, and local congenital syphilis epidemiology. Two of the six recommendations use a threshold for what is considered a high congenital syphilis morbidity rate based on recent California epidemiology. CDPH defines local health jurisdictions with high congenital syphilis morbidity as those with a rate greater than 8.4 congenital syphilis cases per 100,000 live births for any of the past three consecutive years. This threshold reflects the national rate of congenital syphilis in 2012, prior to recent increases in California and the US when California's congenital syphilis rate was below that of the national rate. Therefore, it is established as a goal for CDPH um, to return back to this, this rate. So if you're wondering if your county meets the threshold for high CS morbidity, you can use this to map. Um, dark blue indicates counties which exceed the threshold for high CS morbidity, and those in light blue do not, based on um, surveillance data from 2016 through 2018. So the first recommendation in the guidelines are that um, all pregnant patients should be screened for syphilis at least twice during pregnancy, once at either confirmation of pregnancy or at the first prenatal counter, ideally during the first trimester, and again during the third trimester, ideally between 28 and 32 weeks gestation, regardless of whether such testing was performed or offered during the first two trimesters. The second recommendation is that patients should be screened for syphilis at delivery, except those at low risk who have a documented negative screen in the third trimester. Of note, as mentioned before, local health departments may have uh, their own county specific guidelines to screen all patients for syphilis at delivery, which should be followed if you are a provider that practices within their jurisdiction. Recognized risk factors for syphilis among people who are or could become pregnant include the following. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but many of them we, um, I've already mentioned, including late prenatal care, um, uh, uh, recent uh, diagnosis of um, HIV or another STD, living in a local health uh, jurisdiction with high syphilis or high CS uh, morbidity um, among females, or um, just CS cases in general, um, illicit drug use, um, homelessness, et cetera. The third recommendation is related to emergency department providers. Given only over half of the women who delivered an infant with congenital syphilis did not have prenatal care or only initiated prenatal care in the third trimester, implementation of syphilis screening for pregnant women in other settings could help close this service gap. In case reviews in two high morbidity counties, we found that 16% of mothers who delivered an infant with congenital syphilis were seen in an ED during their pregnancies, 80% of whom lacked any prenatal care. A hospital in Miami-Dade County in Florida incorporated syphilis screening into their ED, 
triggered by either a positive qualitative pregnancy test, patient complaint indicating possible syphilis, or history of an STD. Between April 2018 and August 2019, 4,806 syphilis tests were performed with a 2.5% positivity rate. 32 of uh, were pregnant uh, patients. Ultimately, the program determined they were in nine cases of congenital syphilis. In local health jurisdictions with um, high CS morbidity, EDs are an important setting for syphilis detection and linkage to treatment among pregnant patients without prenatal care and whose disease may otherwise go unidentified. Therefore, CDPH recommends that emergency department providers consider confirming the syphilis status of all pregnant patients prior to discharge, either via documented test results in pregnancy or syphilis tests in the ED if documentation is unavailable. The fourth recommendation um, is um, um, that, you know, is related to, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, given the fact that there's, we, as noted before, that a high percent of uh, female syphilis cases um, and congenital syphilis cases are associated with recent incarceration, our fourth recommendation is that all people who are or could become pregnant entering an adult correctional facility located in a local health jurisdiction with high CS morbidity should be screened for syphilis at intake or as close to intake as feasible. Fifth recommendation is that all sexually active people who could become pregnant should receive at least one lifetime screen for syphilis with additional screening for those at increased risk. Lastly, um, and related to the fifth recommendation is that um, all sexually active people who could become pregnant should be screened for syphilis at the time of each HIV test. Um, given risk factors for HIV and syphilis um, overlap and both can be tested uh, with blood. Next, I'm gonna jump into the clinical manifestations of syphilis. So um, syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum or T pallidum uh, for short. It's a spirochete, um, as you can see on the image, um, which is a corkscrewed uh, shaped bacteria. It's too skinny to be visualized by direct microscopy and um, the inability to culture it in vitro makes the diagnosis complicated. There are three ways of transmission, two of which are clinically relevant. Um, direct contact of infectious um, lesions um, is most common, which is usually um, through sexual uh, contact. Um, transmission can also occur through vertical transmission via the placenta. And um, lastly, um, there actually can be transmission um, through blood, such as through blood transfusions, but uh, this is quite rare. Um, all donors are screened for syphilis and um, T. pallidum cannot survive longer than 24 to 48 hours under, uh, under blood bank storage conditions. Um, the incubation period for syphilis on average is about three to four weeks, um, but can range from 10 to 90 days. Syphilis is characterized by episode and stages of active disease during which patients have signs and symptoms of, inf of infection interrupted by periods of latent or asymptomatic infection. After exposure, uh, there is an incubation period of three to four weeks of syphilis, uh, uh, oh, sorry, incubation period of three to four weeks um, before a, a syphilis ulcer or chancre appears. The initial lesion is a papule that appears at the site of exposure and then grows and ulcerates, producing the typical chancre of primary syphilis. Classically, the ulcer of syphilis is single, painless, indurated with minimal exudate, and can have rolled edges. Importantly, since primary syphilis ulcer um, can be painless, they can go unrecognized, particularly in women if they are um, in the vagina, as well as if they are in the anus rectum for both men and women. Additionally, regional painless lymphadenopathy can be found on exam. The chancre can resolve on its own, even without treatment. It also, over, it also can overlap with the next stage of infection, secondary syphilis. The rash is most common in secondary syphilis, often involving palms, the palms and soles. Um, secondary syphilis can also present with generalized lymphadenopathy and constitutional symptoms such as low-grade fever, malaise, sore throat, headache. Um, can also present with um, mucus hatches and condyloma lata. I have some photos I'll show you in a bit. Um, patchy alopecia can also occur, including around the eyebrows. Um, subclinical hepatitis can occur too, um, which is detected by lab, labs. Um, Lab test revealing elevated liver enzymes, um, particularly uh, alkaline phosphatase. 
Symptoms of secondary syphilis can also resolve on its own without treatment. And when someone no longer has clinical manifestations, but has serological evidence of syphilis, um, then they're considered to be in uh, latent syphilis. Secondary relapses can occur in 25% of patients whose infections have become latent, with most relapses occurring in the first year. Partly, uh, this is partly why latent syphilis has been divided into early and late um, on the basis of time when untreated individuals are likely to have um, spontaneous mucocutaneous infectious uh, relapses. Early latent is when there's evidence of infection that occurred within the past 12 months. Otherwise, it's considered late latent or syphilis of unknown duration. Tertiary syphilis can affect the skin, bones, central nervous system, heart, or aorta, um, such as aortic aneurysms. Um, studies in pre-antibiotic era uh, suggest that um, about a third of untreated infections were followed by tertiary complications, such as neurosyphilis, um, um, gummas, and cardiovascular disease. However, in the antibiotic era, all, now, um, all of these are now rare curiosities in the developed world, probably because the effect of intermittent antibiotics on the development of um, tertiary syphilis. It's important to note that neurosyphilis can occur at any stage of syphilis. This is a common misperception that um, it only occurs in late syphilis. In addition, even though early syphilis is considered the infectious period in which sexual partners can um, transmit uh, infection, um, transmission from mother to fetus can occur at any stage of infection. So these are some photos of um, the shanker. Um, again, appears uh, uh, 10 to 90 days after initial infection. Um, classically, it's single. Uh, painless, indurated, with clean base lesions, rolled edges, and can go un unrecognized as mentioned before. Um, however, um, it can also present uh, with multiple lesions, as you can see um, in the uh, second and third photos. Um, and um, this uh, can, they can persist um, in secondary syphilis and um, multiple lesions are more common in HIV infected individuals. Um, so these are examples of oral shankers. Um, so syphilis can be transmitted through oral sex as well. So it's important to do a good oral exam and check mucous membranes. Um, the rash um, of secondary syphilis is displayed here. So it's classically diffuse symmetric macular papular eruption, though it can really take almost any form, but rarely vesicular. Um, copper colored macular rash on the left is classic and um, uh, you can also see red or reddish brown papules as seen in the other photos. Um, lesions are often scaly, although they may be smooth, follicular, or rarely pustular. Usually covers the entire trunk and the extremities, and of course the pulmons and soles, given an important clue of a diagnosis of secondary syphilis. Syphilis can be difficult to distinguish from pityriasis rosea, so it's important that if that's on your differential to also test for syphilis. Um, this is just examples of the um, pulmonar and plantar rash. Um, these are examples of mucus patches of the mouth, which are highly infectious. Um, example of patchy alopecia. Um, this is condylomalata. Um, this term is for large, uh, raised, whitish, or gray lesions found in warm, um, moist areas, often seen in the perineum, perivolo area, or around the anus, and are, are very infectious. Um, they can be confused for anal genital warts. So whenever you see condyloma acuminata, also think condyloma lata and syphilis. Uh, remember, neurosyphilis can occur at any stage of syphilis. Um, early manifestations usually um, occur months to years after um, and um, include uh, cranial nerve dysfunction, meningitis, stroke, altered mental status, hearing loss or vision changes. Um, Neurosyphilis also includes uh, both ocular and otosyphilis. Um, late manifestations um, that typically occur 10 to 30 years after infection um, can, uh, are, are represented in um, conditions such as TB's corsalis and general parasis. Um, and um, in these conditions, um, uh, people can present with Dementia, psychosis, gait disturbances, lightning pains, or incontinence. So um, in terms of diagnosing, um, dark field, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 
TPLM can't be cultured in vitro. Um, there are some direct detection methods, um, including dark field microscopy and PCR. Um, dark field uh, is not really widely available and usually limited to SC clinics, but allows for point of care diagnosis of syphilis, um, usually primary syphilis, where serologies may be falsely negative. PCR is also a um, potential option to test, but there's uh, currently uh, no commercial tests that are FDA cleared. And it's also not useful for blood or uh, CSF. Therefore, serologic testing is often used. Um, this requires both treponemal and non-treponemal testing. Use of only one type of test is insufficient. The treponemal tests, such as the EIA and TPPA, are antibodies specific to T. pallidum. Um, occasionally, they can cause false positives, um, such as to endemic treponematoses, such as yaws. But, um, and, and the important thing to note is that um, treponemal tests are generally only useful for new infections because antibodies um, usually stay positive for life and have uh, no, um, and have, uh, don't have a titer to assess for reinfection or response to treatment. That's why also, um, that's is the reason why we also need um, non triple neural tests. Non triple neural tests, such as the RPR and VDRL, are non specific to syphilis. They detect antibodies to cardiolipin, which is present in blood of patients with syphilis. However, they allow for quantitative titers to be measured to assess for reinfection and response to treatment. Generally, um, RPR and VDRL measures disease burden with titers peaking in the secondary stage. They then decline in latent syphilis, even if untreated. Although, as you can see on um, the graph, uh, treated syphilis tends to bring titers down much faster. In some people, non-treponemal antibodies can persist for a long period of time, even after adequate response to treatment, which is referred to as the serofast reaction. Usually sta uh, it stabilizes at a low level, such as a titer less than one to eight, but higher serifest titers are occasionally seen, particularly in HIV positive patients. So how do you interpret RPR and VRLs? Um, well, first of all, um, these tests um, often correlate with disease activity um, and are used to follow treatment response. Results should be reported quantitatively. A twofold change, such as from 1 to, th 1 to 32 to 1 to 64, is generally considered within the margin of error of the test and not considered significant. A fourfold change in titer equivalent to change of two dilutions, for instance, from 1 to 16 uh, to 1 to 4, is considered necessary to demonstrate a clinically significant difference between two non treponemal test results obtained using the same serologic test. Sequential serologic tests in individual patients should be performed using the same testing methods, um, the VDRL or RPR, and preferably um, by the same laboratory. The VDRL and RPR are equally valid assays, but quantitatively, um, or quantitative results from the two cannot be compared directly because RPR titers are often slightly higher than VDRL titers. Uh, so there are two different ways you can screen for syphilis, one via the traditional screening algorithm, and the other way being the reverse screening algorithm. Um, and we're seeing that the reverse screening algorithm is being used more frequently. Treponemal tests such as the EIA and CIA can be automated and does not require manual labor and can decrease the cost for labs running these tests at high volume. Uh, so the, for the traditional screening algorithm, you can start with an RPR. If negative, uh, you are done, but if positive, the test uh, should reflect to a treponemal test such as the TPPA. If the TPPA is positive, this indicates that the patient has either past or present syphilis. The patient's clinical history, including previous treatment and titers, as well as the current RPR titer, will inform you whether it is an old treated infection, a past infection that was um, inadequately treated, or a new infection. If the TPPA is negative, syphilis is unlikely and um, this is considered a biologic uh, false positive. Some clinical laboratories are screening samples using treponemal tests, typically by EIA or CIA. Um, these reverse screening algorithms um, uh, for syphilis testing can identify people uh, previously treated for syphilis, those untreated or incompletely treated for syphilis, and those with false positive results and occur with a low likelihood of infection. 
for the reverse screening algorithm, you start with an EIA or CIA, and if negative, um, you're, you're done. Um, if a person has a positive EIA or CIA, they should have a standard RPR with titer performed reflexively by the lab to guide patient management decisions. If the person has a positive RPR, the person has past or present syphilis, similar to traditional screening algorithm. However, if the non-treponemal test is negative, the laboratory should perform a different treponemal test, preferably one based on different antigens in the original test, to confirm the results of the initial test. If a second treponemal test is positive, a history of previous adequate treatment will require no further management unless sexual history suggests likelihood of re-exposure. In this instance, um, a repeat non-treponemal test in two to four weeks is recommended to evaluate for early infection, since in very early syphilis, treponemal tests may become positive before the RPR. Those without a history of treatment for syphilis should be offered treatment. Unless history or results of a physical examination suggest a recent infection, previously untreated persons should be treated for late latent syphilis. If the second treponemal test is negative and epi the um, epidemiological risk and clinical probability for syphilis is low, further evaluation of treatment um, is not indicated. So um, there are some diagnostic challenges um, with syphilis uh, serologies. So um, one is false negatives. Um, so um, as I mentioned uh, before, there can be false negatives for early primary and late latent stages. Um, for primary syphilis, serology may be negative up to 25% of the time. Um, TPPA appears to be more sensitive than the RPR for primary syphilis. So if you see um, um, uh, a lesion that is suspicious for Schenker um, uh, or primary syphilis, um, you can, uh, it's recommended to send both an RPR and a TPP at the same time and empirically treat that patient if the, per the patient is at high risk and there's a high index of suspicion based on clinical findings. There's also this um, phenomenon called the pros and reaction. So this is a false negative RPR or VDRL um, due to high antibody titers um, that prevent antibody antigen um, um, complex formation. If, high, if there's high clinical suspicion for syphilis, such as um, rash or secondary syphilis, um, or uh, um, you, know, you can actually call the lab and ask them to dilute the sample, um, which may uh, uh, prevent the um, test from being a false negative. Um, and the pros and reaction is uh, more common in those with HIV. Um, there's several factors that are associated with biologic false positives, um, which is um, when the RPR VDRL test is positive and the negative confirmatory treponemal test is negative. Um, such examples of, of causes of BFPs um, are um, older age, certain autoimmune diseases, leprosy, yaws, and HIV infection. Um, there's more limited data that, exist, that exists um, um, for malaria, hepatitis C infection, hepatitis C infection, um, and person uh, and, and people who use um, injection drugs. There's also some mixed data um, related to pregnancy and um, biologic false positives. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, discordance serology, which I mentioned um, before, um, can occur um, and was explained on the last slide. So. Um, Treble animal tests and syphilis serologies can be really confusing, especially when you are uh, using um, the reverse screening algorithm. Um, the CD, uh, CDPH SD Control Branch um, and California Prevention Training Center um, did create some uh, guidance for medical providers and laboratories in California uh, that we created in 2016. And there is a table um, there specifically uh, for interpreting a discordant uh, treponemal results in asymptomatic pregnant patients. So here is a syphilis staging flowchart. Um, if the timing of an infection is not known, late, late, late latent syphilis um, um, is presumed. So uh, people who can receive a diagnosis of early latent syphilis, however, if um, during the prior year, they had a seroconversion or sustained fourfold titer increase, had unequivocal symptoms of primary and secondary syphilis, um, or uh, had a sex partner with uh, primary or secondary or early latent syphilis. Um, and uh, 
Also, uh, you can also have a, 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 a fourfold increase in titers that can also, um, uh, within the past year, um, that would also suggest uh, early syphilis. Um, in the absence of these conditions, an asymptomatic person should be considered to have late, uh, uh, late latent syphilis. Non-terminal uh, titers or RPR titers um, are usually higher earlier in the course of syphilis infection. However, early latent syphilis cannot be readily diagnosed solely on the basis of um, the RPR titer. All people with latent syphilis should have careful examination of all accessible mucosal surfaces, um, like the oral cavity, perineal area, perineum, perineum and vagina in women, and um, if also seeing men um, underneath the forcing of uncircumcised men. Um, and then mentioning that neurosyphilis as well, um, if there's any signs uh, suggested of neurosyphilis, um, this can be either early or late uh, syphilis. Um, so treatment um, with a focus in pregnancy. So um, as you remember, we, the case from before, um, we had Ava here who had come in um, and uh, for her, her first prenatal um, visit um, and um, we decided to test her for HIV uh, and syphilis. So you ended up screening her for syphilis at, um, at that first visit. Her RPR comes back reactive with a titer of one to 16 and her TPPA is uh, reactive. She reports no ulcers or rash in the past year and physical exam is unremarkable. What treatment do you recommend? A, benzene, penicillin G, 2.4 million units, intramuscular in a single dose. B, benzene, penicillin G, 7.2 million units total, administered as three doses of 2.4 million units IM each at one week intervals. C, doxycycline, 100 um, milligrams PO, BID, times 14 days. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO, BID, times 28 days or E azithromycin, two grams PO um, times one dose. So I'll give you all a few moment, moments to um, answer the question. Okay, and the poll. So it sounds like um, most people um, said uh, benzene penicillin G, 7.2 million units total administers three doses of 2.4 million units IM each at one week intervals. So um, I can understand why people said that, and um, but uh, I was actually um, trying to indicate that um, the treatment would be uh, benzene penicillin uh, G, 2.4 million units um, I am in a single dose. Um, this is um, because uh, she has what we consider uh, early latent syphilis because uh, she had a negative RPR test um, um, prior uh, when she was uh, incarcerated um, 10 months ago, although you would certainly want to confirm that that test was negative um, and it wouldn't hurt to treat her um, with three doses um, if you're not sure um, if she has early or, or late syphilis. All right, so the only treatment for syphilis in pregnancy is penicillin. The trade name for benzene penicillin G is bicillin LA, um, which uh, stands for long acting. It is not the same as bicillin CR, and, and we've noted providers who have used bicillin CR, which does not adequately treat syphilis. While doxycycline can be used in non-pregnant patients as an alternate treatment, it's a contraindication during pregnancy and thus not appropriate to use in pregnancy. You'll want to treat with a penicillin regimen appropriate for the stage of infection. In addition, you'll want to draw a baseline titer um, at the time of treatment, which I'll go into later. So pregnant women with an IgE mediated penicillin allergy should be desensitized in the hospital and treated with penicillin. Um, since penicillin is the only treatment choice in pregnancy. IgE-mediated allergies um, can, can be confirmed with skin testing in consultation with an allergist. Um, when someone reports a penicillin allergy, it's good to evaluate if someone really has a penicillin allergy by asking what medication they were taking, what kind of reaction occurred, 
when it happened, and how the reaction was managed, in addition to also what the actual outcome was. Um, many people often report an unknown allergy um, when they were a kid, um, something that their parents had told them about, and most people don't truly have an IgE-mediated penicillin allergy. Approximately 10% of all U.S. patients um, report having an allergic action to penicillin, um, class antibiotics. Um, however, many of these patients who report penicillin allergies do not have a true IgA-mediated reaction. And when evaluated, fewer than 1% of the population are truly allergic to penicillins. Um, even people with a true IgA-mediated penicillin allergy usually lose their sensitivity after 10 years. Women treated um, during the second half of pregnancy are at risk for premature labor um, um, and um, something called uh, the uh, yarish hirschheimer reaction. Um, this is an acute febrile reaction that frequently is accompanied by headache, myalgia, fever, and other symptoms that can occur within the first 24 hours after the initiation of any therapy for syphilis. Um, and it's due to uh, an uh, inflammatory response from dying treponemes. Uh, most commonly, um, um, this occurs uh, during primary and secondary syphilis, um, presumably because there's a higher bacterial burden in these stages. And in these cases, um, some providers will consider treating um, these uh, patients in the, uh, on the LND floor. Um, however, concern for this complication should not delay treatment. Um, So uh, while early um, syphilis, which again um, comprises of, of primary, um, secondary, and early latent syphilis only requires one dose of intramuscular benzocene penicillin, some experts recommend a second dose of benzocene penicillin G uh, be given a week after the initial dose of early syphilis, although um, giving one dose is, is fine and, and, um, and, and it's not necessarily, but um, uh, there is some suggestion that two doses could uh, uh, lead to better um, fetal outcomes. Um, the and late, um, however, when you're talking about late latent syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration, it requires three doses of intramuscular benzene penicillin at weekly intervals. So in pregnant women, CDC states that um, that if doses are missed, then uh, you need to restart three uh, three dose series. However, as a practical approach, um, think that aiming for strict seven-day intervals is ideal. If the treatment interval happens to fall at six or eight days, um, then it might be adequate. Um, you may not need to restart treatment, but should consider consulting with your local ID specialist or STD controller. And these strict intervals is one of the reasons why syphilis, and particularly late syphilis, um, can be so difficult to adequately treat. So just going back to the answers um, mentions that um, uh, benzathine penicillin G and, and one intramuscular dose is the recommended treatment for early syphilis. Um, uh, when it's administered as three doses, um, each at a weak interval, that's the recommended treatment for late syphilis. Doxycycline can be um, an alternative treatment for early syphilis. However, that's only for non-pregnant patients given um, it's contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, doxycycline 100 milligrams um, POBID times 28 days is the alternative treatment for late syphilis in non-pregnant patients. Again, can't be used in pregnancy, um, but can't, you, this can be used as an option for non-pregnant patients. And then azithromycin two grams is not recommended as there has been documented macrolide resistance and treatment failure. All right, so in terms of neurosyphilis, um, important again to, to assess for neurological signs and symptoms and do a neuro exam. Um, if clinical evidence of neurologic involvement is, is observed, um, such as signs and symptoms of meningitis or stroke, visual changes, cranial nerve palsies, hearing loss, et cetera, um, a lumbar puncture for CSF examination um, should be performed. Um, the treatment is aqueous crystalline penicillin G for 10 to 14 days. Um, the dosing and, and um, schedule for that is, is on the slide. Um, one note is that the duration of the recommended and alternative regimens uh, for neurosyphilis are shorter than the duration of the regimen used for uh, late latent syphilis. Um, then, therefore, you know, if you're diagnosing someone with late um, syphilis or unknown duration and neurosyphilis, um, um, you may want to consider uh, treating um, with um, up to three uh, weekly doses of IM. Um, penicillin um, 
um, after the completion of treatment for syphilis, for neurosyphilis, um, in order to treat for both the neurosyphilis and the um, uh, late uh, uh, syphilis infection. So um, in terms of follow-up after treatment of syphilis and pregnancy, providers should repeat titers at 20, 32 weeks in delivery. The baby should also get an RPR at delivery as well. Um, Post-treatment serological response during pregnancy varies widely. Um, many women do not experience a fourfold decline by delivery. Um, in fact, one study found that only 38% of patients achieved a fourfold decline by delivery. This occurs more often for patients who are older, treated later in pregnancy, and diagnosed with um, latent syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration. The CDC um, states that uh, treatment failure should not be considered until 6 to 12 months after therapy for early stage disease or 12 to 24 months for late stage infection. Um, additional management considerations um, are um, you know, if, a syph if syphilis is diagnosed in the second half of pregnancy, um, make sure to perform a obstetric ultrasound. Um, this is because uh, hepatomegaly, ascites, hydrops, fetal anemia, um, or thickened placenta um, is associated with a greater risk of fetal treatment failure. It's also really important to presumptively treat um, and test all partners or else uh, your patient will be at risk for reinfection. Um, for those partners, it's important to get a titer, but you're, you're still gonna treat presumptively as patients um, uh, and, or as the partners of patients may still be, um, uh, may still have incubating uh, syphilis and may be seronegative. Um, if someone is HIV, oh, um, you should also make sure that you uh, test anyone with syphilis for HIV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. And um, if um, that HIV test is negative, um, this is an opportunity uh, to um, offer PrEP um, as a recent syphilis infection is considered an indication for PrEP. So the case continued. Um, so after obtaining uh, her positive syphilis results, you're unable to reach Ava and she is lost to follow up. She ends up in a car accident and goes to the ED at a nearby hospital. She is now 29 weeks gestational age. She does not report taking any antibiotics since her first prenatal visit and still reports no ulcers or rash. What do you recommend? Um, so can we have the pull up, please? Um, so A, do you draw the RPR and treat with benzene penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM in a single dose? B, draw RPR and treat with benzene penicillin G, 7.2 million units total, administers three doses for 2.4 million units IM each at one week intervals. C, since we have already know that she has syphilis, no need to draw RPR. Treat with denosine penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM in a single dose. Or D, since we already know she has syphilis, no need to draw the RPR. Treat with denosine penicillin G, 7.2 million units total, administered at three doses of 2.4 million units IM each at one week intervals. Okay. Giving a little bit more time to vote. Um, and I think due to time, I'm just going to end the poll now. So um, I think this is interesting. There's kind of a smattering of answers. Um, seems like people, most people wanted to draw the RPR, which, um, which is correct. Um, as I mentioned before, it's important to draw a, a day of treatment tighter, um, although it's pretty split in terms of whether you're gonna treat the person with a single dose versus um, three doses of, of um, penicillin. Um, so, um, so the right answer is uh, B. And um, the reason for that is that um, now that it's been, um, it's been over a year since her infection, um, um, since her negative, or, uh, her negative test was um, um, 10 months before her first prenatal visit, and now she's at 29 weeks gestational age. So maybe a trick question if that information, if you didn't remember that information, but um, we would wanna treat her for late latent syphilis. Um, and also I mentioned that you wanna do a day of treatment titer. So I um, wanna just quickly go over the importance of a day of treatment titer. So let's say you have a test, uh, that you test a patient for syphilis and their RPR titer is one to uh, 256. However, on the day of follow-up titer to assess response, you know that the RPR titer is the same. However, if you had a day of treatment titer, there may have been a high peak titer, um, but in this case, it was not checked. So, um, you know, if you had checked it, it could have been one to 1,024. Um, so performing a day of treatment titer establishes baseline to compare response post-treatment. This is frequently forgotten and without a baseline, um, it can be uh, make assessment for titer response difficult. Okay, congenital syphilis um, is next. This is gonna be pretty brief, um, but uh, it mentioned, you know, mostly uh, transmission is through um, mother to child, um, less commonly um, 
via direct contact of infectious lesions um, at birth. Um, it's associated with uh, um, higher maternal stages of disease, um, such as secondary syphilis and, and higher maternal uh, disease titers. Um, so pregnant women, you know, treatment for uh, maternal treatment of, uh, of syphilis um, is, is highly effective in preventing congenital syphilis. Um, although, as I mentioned, pregnant women with secondary syphilis are more likely to have treatment failure. 6% um, of babies um, born to women with uh, secondary syphilis have genital syphilis despite appropriate therapy. Also noted that um, treatment failure was more likely when treatment occurred later in pregnancy, as seen here, where 7% of cases resulted in babies um, with congenital syphilis for women treated at 36 to 40 weeks gestational age. Um, so, you know, most babies actually don't have uh, uh, symptoms of congenital syphilis at birth, but um, symptoms when they do appear um, uh, can be split into early and late. Um, I'm actually, um, because of time, I'm just gonna um, jump through and show some pictures, but, you know, I think these slides were sent out. So um, these are some examples of early manifestations um, of congenital syphilis, and these are some of the late manifestations of, of um, congenital syphilis. And um, you know, stillbirth is certainly uh, something that that happens, um, and a fear complication. Uh, um, you know, this study just shows that um, prenatal syphilis. Uh, I'm sorry, prenatal treatment um, dramatically reduces risk of CS stillbirth by over 80 percent. Um, however, given most stillbirths um, occur at less than 28 weeks, it's important to screen and treat syphilis as soon as possible. So, um, in terms of prenatal syphilis management. Um, I uh, just, you know, I think, you know, for the most part, the pediatrician um, is going to be managing it. And the focus is really, uh, for this talk, is on prenatal um, uh, syphilis and, and treating the, the pregnant patient. But um, just want to note that, you know, both, uh, uh, you know, diagnosing syphilis can be quite difficult, um, as many infants um, born to mothers with syphilis are asymptomatic, and both maternal and non terminal antibodies can be transferred through the placenta to the fetus. Um, so treatment decisions have to be based on a number of other factors, much of which the prenatal care provider can uh, communicate to the pediatrician. It includes um, identification of syphilis in the mother, um, adequacy of maternal treatment, um, and comparison of uh, maternal um, titers at delivery um, to, the, to the baby's um, titers. And this is um, a really great um, algorithm uh, uh, that and uh, job aid that we've created at the CDPH that goes through um, what to do in terms of uh, managing um, uh, congenital syphilis um, um, for uh, infants that are exposed in utero. Um, I'm not going to go over it because it's really complicated again. This is really more for um, the pediatrician or person evaluating the baby and, and less so important for the prenatal care provider. But um, you can go to our website to find out more information um, on this um, or look into it more detail. So lastly, I just want to quickly go over um, making sure that you collaborate with your, your local health department. Um, Reporting of syphilis is, is mandatory um, and um, um, supposed to be done within one business day um, per the California Code of Regulations. Um, this is important because um, you know your local health department can actually be um, be really helpful and um, be an ally in trying to uh, treat your patients and their partners. So um, first of all, they can provide information on syphilis history, including past tears and treatment. They can help find patients who are lost to follow up. Um, they can also notify partners anonymously and get them tested and treated and also help provide access to treatment for syphilis. So um, it makes it easier for them to do that when, when you do report um, syphilis to the local health department. Um, this is an example of um, the form. Um, and um, uh, this is an example from Orange County, but where you can fax it to, mail or call um, and additional variables and demographic information that um, you can include as well. So lastly, these are just resources. Um, you can um, go to the SD Control Branch website, um, std.ca.gov, um, the Arkansas General Syphilis uh, webpage, which has a lot of different resources there. We have um, some uh, flyers for patients in the public, um, customizable patient education materials, um, also a, a relatively uh, new uh, pocket kind of card flyer that um, is for pregnant patients and uh, focuses not just on syphilis, but also um, what uh, patients can do um, in terms of um, preventing HIV, um, hepatitis B, um, you know, also getting the flu shot and some precautions about Zika and travel. These are recommendations um, from the CDPH on uh, 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 testing in um, pregnancy. And um, again, I mentioned this before, um, there's also a pocket card um, for prenatal care providers, uh, which kind of summarizes a lot of the information that was discussed today. Um, a CDC syphilis pocket guide, 
Um, and then obviously the CDC treatment guidelines, which are going to be updated uh, soon in 2021. Um, and also just a call out to the SCCCN, um, um, uh, which is a SCD clinical consultation network. Um, this is a great place where you can um, get uh, a, a online um, consultation advice um, um, on complex SD cases, um, anything general syphilis you can ask, um, and then someone will be able to get back to you as soon as one business day, um, but up to five business days. And that's, you can indicate the urgency of um, um, completing that request um, when you submit uh, your consult. So um, some take home points. Um, sorry, I know I'm at one o'clock um, right now, but just wanna quickly go over that, um, you know, um, syphilis among females and infants are increasing in California. Most congenital syphilis cases can and should be prevented. Um, and you wanna screen pregnant, women at syphilis at first prenatal encounter and the third, early in the third trimester. And don't just assume someone else has. So if you see her at urgent care and she's in her th you know, third trimester or in the ED, um, I would just go ahead and, and, and test her. Um, Want to treat syphilis as soon as possible, get a day of treatment tighter, contact your local health department if challenges, um, if you have any challenges providing treatment to the patient um, and the partners, um, including getting um, uh, 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 the penicillin. Um, and then uh, you're gonna to wanna to confirm syphilis testing at delivery. Um, tested delivery unless low risk and documented negative screen in the third trimester, and then report um, to your local health department within uh, one business day of any uh, um, syphilis cases. Finally, use the sscn.org for any management questions um, that you might have. Thank you. Um, these are my acknowledgments, um, and um, I, I'm happy to stay a few minutes um, if there's um, any questions that um, I can answer uh, during the webinar. Hey, thanks so much, um, Dr. Tang. And I've been um, I've been fielding some questions, so we've gotten a couple good ones. Um, a few I've just been answering in the text, so hopefully the requesters are able to see the answers that I've been typing in. Um, but let's go to a couple that I think are pretty good. Um, and um, and also thank you so much for that very very comprehensive um, overview. So. Um, Let's see, so one thing that came up is, oh, and now we have um, a couple more that are coming in. So one that just came in that's uh, pretty interesting is if you have any information on rapid syphilis testing. Um, that's from Danelle Piet, um, Pieters. Um, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Danelle, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but I know that rapid syphilis testing is a pretty hot topic. And so how would you, um, how would you incorporate rapid syphilis testing in the context of congenital syphilis prevention? That's a really great question. Um, so right now, um, there's two rapid syphilis tests, um, the syphilis health check, um, which has been out for a few years. Um, there's also a combined um, HIV and syphilis uh, rapid test that can be done um, with just a finger prick um, that just was recently released. Although it, it's not clear, that, that second test is not clear wave right now, um, but the, uh, the manufacturer is, um, has submitted um, a request to get a clear wave, which may increase um, where it can, where it can be uh, uh, performed. Um, but, um, you know, both of these tests only test for treponema um, antibodies. They don't test for RPR. So it's a little bit incomplete and, and not as useful for people who have a, a known history of syphilis um, in the past. Um, it can be really great for people who don't have any um, syphilis and, and it's positive. Um, then you can, you know, presumptively treat them and also get that RPR um, as well as you're treating them. Um, but, um, you know, these tests also aren't, aren't quite as good um, as uh, laboratory based tests. Um, but, you know, I always think that if there is, uh, you know, if there's people that aren't getting tested because they can't come to the clinic, you know, if we can give them a test out in the field or at a homeless encampment or wherever it is, um, um, or in the ED setting, for instance, like it can be useful because um, it's better to get a rapid test and not get any tests at all. So um, I think thinking about ways where, you know, reaching those additional um, uh, uh, patients who, who we're not getting to um, would would be kind of a place you might think about um, using a rapid syphilis test. Roz, do you have anything else to add? No, and that is, um, I think that I, um, you know, I think you covered everything. Um, and I know we're at 104, so I'm going to just, um, try to find one more good question and then we'll have to wrap up. So one question that came up 
is, um, is there a grace period for when attempting to call a case an early latent case? Sometimes there's a fourfold RPR increase or a negative RPR history just a few days over one year. So how, how much of a stickler do we have to be about that one year cutoff? Um, I would love to know your thoughts. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I think the most conservative thing to do is just to treat that person as like syphilis for just a few days over. Um, I think that's the safest thing to do. Um, interestingly, um, and uh, I think the British guidelines, they actually yep. say in syphilis. the UK. Yeah, in the UK, they um, say that early syphilis is um, infection within the first two years. So it is arbitrary, but, you know, given that the CDC kind of lays out what is considered early and late, um, and if it's just a day over, I mean, it's probably fine just getting one dose, but um, if you're going to follow the guidelines strictly, um, you, I would give three doses of, of, of penicillin. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I wish that we, I wish we had more time to go through these questions. I think they're excellent questions. Um, I've tried to answer a few of them in the chat myself, so hopefully that's been helpful to the um, to the attendees who asked, but if you have any pressing questions or anything that comes up clinically, we do have something called the STDCCN, which is the STD Clinical Consultation Network. It's stdccn.org. Um, Dr. Tang and myself are both clinical faculty as well as other subject matter experts. And so we can also answer questions there. Um, and then you also have Elizabeth Olson's email address if you want to um, contact her about any of the logistic questions that came up. So thank you so much, Dr. Tang, for that incredibly thorough presentation. You covered a very wide range of syphilis in a very short amount of time. Um, so with that, thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.